Hello everyone. My name is Pasi Havia and I'm a portfolio manager of HCP Quant and HCP Focus Funds. Today we are sitting here in Tallinn and our topic is going to be Baltic stocks. I'm here together with my friend Matthias Wallander, who is the founder of uh, Enlight Research. Uh, Matthias, I know that you actually moved from Sweden to Estonia. Could you explain to us like what made you do this kind of a move? Right, so I came to Estonia about 20 years ago, uh, working uh, all the time uh, in Swedish banks with the Baltic financial markets. But about two years ago, I started Enlight Research, uh, which many people in the Baltic knows as the site where you can get free high quality equity research. And this is uh, what I've also understood that you exactly uh, your focus is Baltic markets, right? Uh, that is correct. We today only follow Baltics except for uh, one company, which is Danish. And that was our first non-Baltic company that we initiated about two weeks ago. But yeah, the, the main focus is the Baltics. Mm, interesting. Uh, can you tell us like what makes the Baltic markets different from, from let's say, like Scandinavian markets, for example? Right. I, when I came here, I was very surprised uh, about how low the competition is compared to the Swedish market. Uh, and of course, compared to the US market, which many of, of us have traded a lot. And as soon as something happens, you know, the share price moves right away. Uh, also the same in most Swedish stocks today. So can uh, you say that uh, actually Baltic stocks are less efficient than, than in quite many other countries. Yes, definitely. Uh, in Baltics, you do not have computer trading. Uh, so when a report comes out or something happens, uh, it, you actually have time as a, as a human being to, to react. Uh, sometimes in a report, you have days to react. Uh, so in that way, I would say as a private investor, uh, you are much better off versus the competition. I mean, we all know in the US or, or in Sweden, I don't know how it is in Finland, but something happens and the c computers, mm. they, they adjust the price like within seconds. Mm. True. This is making it like quite fruitful for stock pickers, this kind of markets uh, where they are not that competitive and, and they are less efficient. True. I mean, fundamental long-term stock pickers uh, have a much better chance in the Baltics than in Scandinavia and, of course, the US. Mm. Uh, of course, the downside of that is the liquidity. Uh, the low competition comes with much lower liquidity. So that is why you have to be long-term. Mm. Uh, in Finland, for example, we have some companies where the state is a very strong owner. It owns like a big chunk of the, of the company and also they have their own policies like how they want the company to be run. Uh, how this uh, with the Baltic uh, companies, like does the state have any big ownership in any companies, for example? Yes, definitely. I mean, you have all the uh, state IPOs that have been put on the market in the last one or two years. For example, in Estonia, you have Enfit Green, uh, which I think was subscribed by some 60,000 investors. So a very popular IPO. You have Talena Sadam, which many Finns, they, when they arrive to Estonia, they go through Talena Sadam. Uh, so there, the, uh, the government uh, directly or indirectly owns the majority of the stocks. Uh, what kind of owner of the state is? for these kind of companies? I would say very professional. Uh, it's the same uh, transparency and, and, uh, and policies as you would have in, in Sweden or Finland. So Pasi, you're running one of Finland's most well-known quant funds. Uh, could you tell us a bit about your strategy uh, and uh, what you look at or what you try to find when it comes to stock picking? Yes, uh, actually, I have like a three pillars where the whole fund is uh, built on, on top of that. And first, of, first one is uh, so-called value anomaly, which means that usually lowerly priced uh, stocks, they do better in the longer run than high priced stocks. Uh, and I'm evaluation with this. 
And the second pillar is, uh, is the size. Size anomaly, which means that usually smaller size companies, they have a better return than large cap companies. The third one, what I also use is momentum. And the reason why I actually combine value and momentum is that then they don't correlate actually that, that well between each other, so you get diversification benefits. But on, also on the other hand, there's a way for me to avoid so-called uh, value traps. Um, now, one thing about this value investing, and what I want to ask from you, Matthias, is that as we know, few years back, we had like a, this kind of a in investing environment where interest rates were very low and, and companies were very easy to get funding and, and so on. But now this whole environment has changed. We have now much more higher interest rates. We have also inflation running and so on. And <clears throat> you are looking at the Baltic markets. How you see it? Like, is it now better time, in your opinion, for value stocks or, or growth stocks? Uh, that's a good question. I think that's a question the whole stock market is asking. Uh, and that basically depends on uh, when uh, central banks get control of the inflation. So if we see signs of it coming down, obviously, as we've seen in the US, when we hoped for that, that, that growth stocks were back in fashion. Uh, and if it's higher for longer, then, then I think, yeah, it's very favorable for value stocks. Uh, but what I can say about the Baltics is that there are a lot of value stocks, uh, and many of them are, are majority owned by uh, the government. So that means since the Baltic countries have very low uh, debt level, debt to GDP level, uh, then I think at least those uh, government-owned value stocks should be okay when it comes to, to borrowing costs and, and financial stability. Mm. Fossil, could you tell us a bit about uh, your quant strategy? Because I think it's something that we in the Baltics are not very used to. Yes, um, um, like I said, it, it relies on these three different kind of uh, pillars. Uh, the first of all being, being using the value anomaly, which means that I'm looking for companies which are valued very low. And I use a different kind of uh, valuation methods to do so. I don't only use uh, one, one uh, way to do it. One what I can say is, for example, is so-called Piotrowski F-score, which is a nine-point scoring system for the companies. Like, it looks has the company's debt going up or down, for example. Uh, is the efficiency of the company, has it been improving or has it been declining and, and these kind of things. And what comes to the size, uh, in my fund I, I narrow it so that the smallest size of the company is to be uh, 100 million euros, the minimum, and then going up to 10 billion, which is the uh, upper limit of uh, mid-cap size in the United States. So. The companies what I'm generally looking for, they are in between 100 million and, and 10 billion euros. Uh, the third one, what I'm using this momentum, I'm using six months momentum, uh, including also dividends what the company has been paying out. And that means that I'm using, uh, looking the past half year, the pure performance and adding the dividend on it, that the higher uh, the return on this metrics, then it means also the higher the momentum the company has uh, in the price. What I've been discovering uh, with kind of approach is usually that uh, uh, something has activated inside the company why it has changed to go up again. So this is usually like some kind of catalyst has been activated in there. Now we did the exercise uh, uh, with, with the Baltic markets and we couldn't apply it uh, directly like uh, how I'm running the fund with it. First of all, because uh, in Baltic markets, uh, the company sizes are so much more smaller. And so we need to do a few small adjustments uh, to the algorithm. Uh, the first one was that um, we put the lower limit to 50 million euros, and then we also dropped out uh, the momentum factor out of it. And after doing this uh, exercise, we were left um, three very interesting value stocks, what we are uh, 
now going to talk about more deeply. There came out companies Express Coop, Tallinn Asadam, and Tallinn. What you can generally say about these three companies? What they look like to you? Well, I, I think uh, two of them have very much in common, uh, Tallinn Asadam and, and Tallinn. Uh, they both, of course, suffered a lot during the pandemic uh, when, when uh, passenger traffic was basically stopped. Uh, they are both trading uh, close to the lows of, of the pandemic. They haven't really come back. Uh, so I think the, the long-term prospects, if things go back to normal, in both of them could be interesting. Uh, Express Group, I think, is a, is a different case. Uh, it's more of a momentum case, uh, which has transformed itself uh, in the last year, year and a half, when they divested the, the uh, printing division. So now it's a fully, almost fully digital uh, media company. Hmm. Let's now take the deep dive into these three companies. Uh, let's start from Tallinn and Saddam. Uh, would you just first briefly explain the business model, like what they actually do? They just own the ports or what else do they do? Yeah, that, that is uh, actually what they do, which, which, is, which is not so little, I would say. Uh, they, they own uh, Tallinn Saddam port and, and other, I think two other ports in, in uh, Estonia, the one in, in Sarma port. Uh, and, and Paldiski port. Uh, so they have two main revenue streams. Uh, one is uh, passenger traffic, uh, which mainly comes from Tallink, uh, and, and the other is cargo traffic. So they don't actually handle cargo or sell tickets themselves. They, they, uh, they basically uh, rent out, they, they own the property. The, the terminals and so on. And of course, they, they get a passenger fee uh, per passenger. So they have exposure to the number of passengers. Uh, and and uh, Tallink and Tallinn and Saddam, I think what you see in those is that uh, uh, they... Is there some kind of symbiosis between these two companies, Tallink and, and Tallinn and Saddam? Yes, there is kind of a love-hate relationship where of course, Tallink wants to pay as low passenger fee as possible, and, and Tallinn Sabah wants to pay, wants them to pay as high as mm -hmm. possible. But there was a, uh, an agreement just recently where, where they kind of settled on on a fair price, I think. Uh, but I think there are some differences as well. For example, Tallinn Sabah is owned uh, about two thirds is owned by the by the Estonian government. Uh, so they they have a, obviously a much uh, much more uh, stable financial situation. I think uh, if if things were to go really bad, uh, they also pay dividends. We estimate around four percent yield this year, uh, and and they also have something that that I think is very interesting, which is uh, potential for real estate development. Uh, in the harbor. So if, if you've been to the, to the Helsinki harbor, you know there's really nice real estate uh, when you sail into the harbor. And basically we have the same thing here in, in Tallinn, that, that that land is currently uh, being uh, prepared for, for apartments and also office buildings. So I think that could be uh, anything between, uh, I don't know, 10 to 20% of the market cap today. Uh, Tallink, uh, on the other hand, I think you have much more leverage towards the, the number of passenger, the recovery in passenger traffic. Uh, and, and on the normalized, if things go back to normal, uh, just looking at what they did before the pandemic, then the share price should be around 0.8 which is about 50% higher than it is today. Mm. So I think that leverage is, is something that, that might become attractive when you see that it's coming back. Mm. Also, they, they have managed to charter out a lot of ships, uh, a lot of vessels. So I think that the market doesn't really 
uh, realize that they are actually much better off this low season than they have been before. Mm. One thing also what I have uh, learned about Tallink is that uh, they also run hotels, so they have a real estate exposure as well. Can you tell like how big chunk of the business is uh, real estate si uh, side and how much is actually just uh, with the boats? All right. Actually, it's, it's a really small part because uh, they don't actually own the real estate. Uh, it is, is mainly owned by uh, a related real estate ownership company uh, that the main owners of Tallink own. So uh, I can't say that, that the real estate is, is a big part of Tallink. Mm, okay. Interesting also, one, one of my favorite restaurants here in Tallinn is, is Knock Knock. And that is actually owned by Tallink as well, this restaurant. I was quite surprised uh, one time when I went to eat there and you could have give the Tallinn card and you collect the points <laughs> as well. <laughs> do you know, do they have many other restaurants, by the way? I mean, the, the Tallinn main owners, uh, their investment company is, is Infotar, which own a lot of different businesses in, in Estonia. Uh, so I think they own Estegas, they own the Tallinn uh, tennis center where I play a lot. And, and, and so they own, they have many different interests. I mean, it, it's, it's as close as you can de get to, to, for example, the uh, Wallenberg family in, in Sweden, you know, who, who owns a lot of businesses. Uh, and, and so I would say it's the main owner of Tallink is, is uh, kind of family or families. There are several families owned kind of company. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. Um, how was it with the Tallink now? Uh, with the corona times and also know that uh, then there was in, in Estonia, for example, when uh, refugees from Ukraine came, if I remember right, Tallink was also renting uh, one boat where people were put in there as well. Like, how is the business now looking after the whole pandemic? Is it like, again, blooming or it's just getting more traction? Or Right, no, passengers are still on the recovery track. Uh, so it's not like with, with airlines where it's back or, or like uh, tourism uh, f flying somewhere. It's, I think it's back or above 2019 levels. That, that is not the case in, in Tallink uh, or in any passenger. Uh, I think Viking line is the same. Uh, so, but what they have done is, is they have sharded out ships. I think they have here in Tallinn, they have one ship uh, sharded for Ukrainian Ukrainian refugees, uh, and and I think they have one in 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 UK, if I remember correct. Are oh, this uh, how how long uh, leases do you remember? Uh, the, these leases are I think on a one year basis, but they are being prolonged. But then they have many other ships being leased out for much longer, uh, several years. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what I mean that people don't really uh, take that into account when they look at the low season. Uh, so I think we, we estimate that they will make some 60 million in shorter revenues uh, in last year in 2022, mm. which can be compared to around 10 million in, in before the pandemic. So that's mm. a huge difference. Yeah, six, seven times more. That, yeah. that is a huge difference, yes. So, yeah, I, I think those two are uh, two long-term plays that might not look so strong in the short term. Uh, but, uh, you know, if we sit here three, four, five years from now, uh, you, you probably have done, uh, you should have done quite a lot, maybe 40, 50 percent. Mm. How cyclical are, are these two companies? Like, I, I would estimate or, or think that uh, telling business, for example, could be a little bit more cyclical than for Tallinn Saddam, for example. Yes, it's more leveraged uh, because it's basically one to one with the, with the passengers, number of passengers. Uh, so, uh, so Tallinn Saddam, they, they have also cargo, uh, and and also they 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 uh, still get paid for every docking so to speak, so they don't have direct one-to-one -one with the number of passengers. Yeah, and I, I couldn't guess also like uh, uh, during the low seasons, a cargo going probably around the same number as, as always. Uh, yeah. More so, like just passenger numbers, they, they fluctuate more up and down. 
True. So what we saw in, in the pandemic is that but, but even Talink's cargo was okay and Talink's Adams cargo was okay, with the exception then for, for Russian cargo and, and Belarusian cargo, which basically were uh, put on a put on a halt. Mm. So How has it been now affected this uh, whole thing uh, with the Ukraine and, and Russia? Uh, it's been going down steadily, uh, but now I think EU passed this Russian embargo. So, so this year, uh, basically, it, it should disappear. Uh, but uh, and that that is of course a, a negative for, for Tanya Saddam, not for Tallink because they don't do cargo uh, in that direction. Uh, but but yeah. So uh, in on on the other hand, cargo. Uh, non-Russian cargo has been doing really well. So uh, Tallinn and Saddam benefits also from Tallinn's increase or decrease in cargo. Mm. So Pasi, I, I have to say I'm, I'm a bit surprised that uh, Tallinn and Tallinn and Saddam came up. Uh, maybe you could describe a bit what you think, what criteria made them stand out. I mean, I, I, I'm not negative. I, I like them long term, but it's still interesting to hear how the quant strategy came up with the, these two names. Well, first of all, like I was um, explaining before, the main thing is that uh, the valuation for these companies has been, let's say, like too low according to, to the criteria what, what I use, which means that they should have quite nice potential to, to go up, that uh, they shouldn't be valued this low as they are at, at the moment. Mm -hmm. How you see, by the way, their, their valuation? Do you think that they are lowly valued or fairly valued or, or overvalued? Yes, I mean, from a long-term perspective, uh, I, I think that if you just apply how it was before the pandemic, uh, the same EBTA, then it's, it's very lowly valued. You have like 50% upside, something like this. So, so yeah, if your algorithm looks long-term, I can understand why they pop up. And also the fact that the share prices haven't done anything uh, while world markets and Baltic markets have come back, uh, have bottomed mm. out. So, so these are still trading around or lower than they did during the pandemic. Uh, mm. So, so in, when you, when you say that uh, value plays long term, yeah, I, I can see how it can happen. Matthias, we have now talked quite a lot about uh, Talink and Tallinn and Saddam, but there was also a third interesting company that came through, which is AST Express. Can you, in the same way, explain to the people watching this video that uh, what is their main business? What do they do? Right, so it's... it's uh, basically the leading media company in Estonia, uh, with also very good market position in, in Lithuania and Latvia. Uh, and what they did is they divested their print operation about, I think, one and a half, two years ago, which meant that they became almost fully digital uh, from having less than 50% uh, digital sales. Uh, they now have about three fourths digital mm. sales. So this company uh, has like totally transformed. In, yes, in this sense. It, it has. Uh, you know, if you value media with print, it's around six times EBTA. If you value pure digital media companies, it's more like uh, twelve to fifteen EBTA. Uh, so that that. I think uh, the market hasn't fully priced in yet, uh, even though the share price has done well. Uh, it's still undervalued, undervalued to peers. Uh, for example, I think Alma Media is trading at 11 times EBTA, uh, and, and Express is still at around seven. Mm, uh, wow. So I, I think that Express Group could be or should be a good takeover candidate for, for a Finnish or a Swedish media company. Mm. What, what is the size of uh, ST Express? It's around 50 million euro. Mm. And these di digital channels, uh, uh, have they getting now like uh, the company more leverage uh, in their di digital channels? That, um, how are the figures? Are they going up? Like in, in what way? Right. So the, the digital subscribers are 
currently growing, we believe, around 18%. Uh, and and uh, it's... Per annum, per year. Yeah, per annum, yes. Uh, so it's it's much higher, of course, growth in the company when you take away the print, which was declining. Uh, uh, but I have to say too that, speaking about Express, that uh, with with a bit of transparency, uh, I own Express myself. Mm, so okay. so you are if, you think, <laughs> if you think I'm positive, yeah, it might be because I own it. I, I I'd like to think because. Uh, of the fundamentals and, and, the, and the prospects, but it could also be that I'm uh, severely biased. But, mm. but yeah, this, this is what I see in the company. And how do they generate uh, the revenue? Do they have, is it more coming through the advertisement or through subscriptions or, or how? Uh, it's, it's actually both uh, uh, through, the, the main interesting thing right now is through the uh, subscriptions, the digital uh, subscriptions. Uh, the advertising uh, definitely will come, will increase uh, once the subscriber base increases. What they also have, uh, which I think people don't realize, is they have uh, digital, uh, digital marketing screens uh, or digital advertising screens. Uh, so they are one of the leading ones, in, I think, in, in Riga and, and also in Estonia. Plus they have digital ticketing in, in uh, Latvia, uh, which is one of, one of the leading uh, ticketing platforms in Latvia. And they just started one in, in Estonia. So I think they, they do very exciting, uh, interesting things within the digital media market. Uh, and, and yeah, if they succeed, then, then, yeah, then the share looks uh, underpriced. Can you tell a little bit about this uh, ticketing side of side of the business? Uh, right. So, so that was an acquisition they made in in Latvia, uh, and when they bought one of the leading uh, uh, ticketing platforms in in Latvia, and of course then the pandemic hit, uh, which basically stopped business because you couldn't have any events. Uh, but one good thing in all this bad was that, that the, the, uh, the extra payment that they signed uh, or the potential uh, payment, extra payment that they signed uh, became much less, obviously because the, the revenues and earnings became lower. Uh, so, but now it's up and running again, obviously when, when we are back from the pandemic and, and they are entering this, they have just started, launched it in, in Estonia, like I said, uh, and they have some synergies because they can also sell, sell uh, advertising space for the event and then they can lead you to their ticketing site. Uh, okay. So there, there are some synergies between the media business and the ticketing. But uh, possibly the Baltic companies are, are very small. Uh, how how do you how did you do this quant uh, screen uh, on the baltics can you can you really do it on the baltic market uh, not really like how we run it in in the fund uh, so far i can't remember a single case that actually because we invest worldwide all over the world in developing markets and and, and in developed markets so far, there has never been coming out uh, just one single Estonian, Lithuanian or, or Latvian stock. So yes, we did have to make some changes. First one, we had to lower the market cap because uh, like you said, Baltic stocks, they are, their size is very small. So we need, had to come down in the, what is minimum market cap, what mm -hmm. we were looking for. And we lowered that to, that to 50 million euros. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing what we had to do. At that phase, we started to there started to come just what is it, like one or two companies only through. So we then did uh, a second adjustment, which was that we uh, eliminated the momentum criteria from there as well. So what we then added up is that um, we are having then like low priced value stocks, which are of course also very small in, in size right. from this market. Right. And, and how do you just, even though it's not part of the screen, you had to eliminate it. How, did, how do you normally measure momentum? Uh, we use six months momentum so that we just take the six months um, 
uh, price, like how it's been doing. Uh, if it's been going up, that's uh, always a positive momentum. So if it's been going down, then that's a negative momentum. So we basically divide the current stock price with what, what was it six months ago. Mm -hmm. And if the company has been di uh, distributing dividends, then we add, add that up also. Because as you know, when a company actually decides to distribute the dividend, the stock price tanks. So you need to take this into, into mm -hmm. account as well, especially if, if the dividend has been a big then the drop is also very big. So, okay. So, so it was actually so that uh, uh, no Baltic stocks with these criteria uh, had momentum in the last six months. Um, actually, there was one one company that fulfilled uh, those criteria that uh, it was lowly priced and had a high momentum, uh, but it was uh, the market cap was lower than than fifty million euros. And uh, that is Silvano Fashion Group. Okay. What you can right. tell about this company? Uh, right, right. There, there is nothing wrong with the company. I, I, I believe it's uh, quite lowly valued on multiples. Uh, but there is one, uh, one big thing, uh, and that is the, the political, political risk or the political correctness uh, of owning Silvano because they have. Uh, the manufacturing in Belarus and most of the sales to Russia. Uh, so uh, obviously uh, that shuts out most of the most of the Swedish, Finnish, and and, and uh, Nordic funds. I would say maybe even some some uh, local pension funds would would not be allowed to own it. Uh, but but yeah, they they have actually surprised positively. Uh, that they didn't suffer as much because one big market for them was also Ukraine, uh, which basically that sales uh, has has stopped. Uh, but what happened was when all foreign brands stopped selling in, in Russia, uh, then the Russian sales increased enormously. Uh, so yeah, if you if you can live with this with this uh, political risk or incorrectness. Then uh, yeah, I, I can see why Silvana popped up. If we if we dropped this fifty million, yeah, that is probably one of the reasons why it's so lowly valued. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that's it. So how how you see then maybe going like uh, further if we get this uh, uh, war in Ukraine uh, like uh, put to the pass like how you see would then it be like look like could be like good opportunity maybe to right. get into this company? Or do you think it's just too much risk to, to consider? I, I think that this, this uh, political incorrectness might, might last longer. Uh, of course, if, if Russia and, and the West all of a sudden becomes friends again, then yeah, Silvana is an obvious, obvious winner. But, but so if you believe in that, yeah, then, then uh, Silvana could be a candidate when that happens. But if, if you think that, you know, it, it may, even if the war is over, there might be some bad feelings afterwards, then uh, Silvana might, might not be the obvious play. Mm. Yes. So Matthias, we have talk now, talked about uh, three different Baltic companies now, uh, Tallinn and Tallink and Express Group. Uh, in your opinion, how you rank these? Which is of these three is your favorite and which you like the least? Right. So again, I should say that I own all three of them. Uh, I own more Express than, than the other two. Uh, and uh, with that said, I like Express the most in the short term uh, because I think I think they they have. Uh, very good short-term growth still in digital. Uh, plus, they they should pay fairly good dividend. Uh, they just announced a buyback above the share price, and, and it shows that they have dividend uh, payment capability. So, experts, I would say number one uh, uh, right now in the short term. Long term, uh, I think both uh, Tallinn 
Sadam and Talink uh, kind of come together because they are so related. They have more upside probably in, in Talink, but that is also more risky. Uh, so it depends on what you prefer. Uh, the most risky with more upside or, or kind of mm. less risky with a bit less upside. But that is definitely long term place. Uh, I don't think we see very much positive short term news. Uh, so yeah, Express One, Talink and Talink Sadon shared two and three. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> we have the winner and we have What's, who's on the second place and who's, who got the bronze. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this is great. I, I think it's very interesting to see this quant approach to the Baltics. But for, for all the Finnish investors, uh, uh, my question and thinking is, can you trade Baltics uh, from Finland? Actually, you can trade uh, Baltic stocks uh, from Finland. I know that, for example, Nordea and OP, both they do offer uh, Baltic markets. So, so it is possible for Finnish people. And I also think it would be good for Finnish people in general to be more interested of, of Baltic markets, exactly for the reasons what you already brought up, that they are less efficient. And when the markets are less efficient, it always creates more opportunity for, for the stock pickers to to try to earn a, a better premium. So I would suggest for Finnish uh, uh, people there listening and, and watching this video to, to have a little bit more courage and, and go check what there is in, in the Baltic countries to offer uh, and find out that uh, there's very interesting companies. And there's also been very interesting IPOs in the past few years, which I know, like like Saun, for example, Finnish people are sauna crazy people. We only have this one um, same kind of um, stock in Finland called Harbia. So Saun could be like a competitor with those. And, and so there are lots of interesting companies for Finnish people to to find out. So please. Go, yeah. go find out and, and do your own due diligence and, and so on. So, possibly, I mean, that, that's great that Finnish investors have access to, uh, to the Baltics. Uh, uh, I didn't know it was so easy. Uh, but how is it the other way around? Do, uh, can Estonian investors, investors uh, subscribe to your fund, your quant fund? Uh, actually, they can. It's just uh, they actually need to reach us first. We don't have a marketing license in Estonia, so actually we can't do any so-called active marketing in, in these countries. So it is just fine if the customer reaches out and wants to invest, and then everything is, is, is okay. So Matthias, thank you a lot. It was nice talking to you. And uh, all you Finnish people over there, also Estonians and Baltic people as well, Go to Enlight Research web page. You have loaded the page full of different kind of analysis of, of the companies that have been listed in, in Baltic uh, stock markets. Uh, you can find more information about these companies in there. And if you are interested of uh, HCP or HCP quant fund, same thing, you have put the link over there and you can find more information. So until next time, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.